Here's what the word of the Lord says. It reads as this, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. You all can go ahead and have a seat. If I've not had the chance to meet you yet, my name is KJ. I'm one of the pastors here at New Valley, and it's always a joy for us to be able to um, open up God's word uh, together. Uh, this morning, as we, we hone in on this passage, we're going to be looking at a concept, an idea that many of us know in different shapes, but it's going to be focusing in on that last verse there. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ um, forgave you. Forgiveness. Uh, when we think about this idea of forgiveness, it's something that people always preface at times. You might think about this idea of forgiveness in your own life in different ways. You think about someone else and their story and what they've been through, and you maybe have said the phrase before, I don't know how you forgave them. Maybe you think about forgiveness as just being hard. Before you even think about being able to forgive somebody, you think about all of the hurdles, all of the struggles that prohibit you from extending forgiveness. There's some of us in here who are those who are with holders of forgiveness to others. It's from a point of power that you feel that sense of, you have since felt relief from the situation, but you feel like you need to hold it over someone else's head. Sometimes it's hard for you to let go of transgressions. <laughs> this idea here that someone maybe has sinned against you and how dare they sin against you and, and make a mistake against you, and so it's hard for you to forgive them. This morning, as we think about this series that we've been continuing on community, it's important that we have a community that's built on love, a community that's built on the grace of Jesus, but also a community that's built on forgiveness. You might think, yeah, that's simple, that should be the case, then tell me why it's so hard then for you to implement it into a community. Why is it when someone hurts you, you want to pull away? Why is it when someone hurts you, you want to make them work harder to gain your trust? Why do you struggle to actually extend forgiveness to them? You, you make them go to a gauntlet to extend or to experience that forgiveness in your own life. Well, I think this is important for us as followers of Jesus, because as we think about the Christian faith and the Christian story, we are very similar to that which happened in the garden. We we're going to think about the garden for a moment because... Our mess is what makes forgiveness necessary, friends. The mess that started in the garden is actually that same mess that makes forgiveness necessary in your life today. It's in the garden that in Genesis chapter 3, when, when God created the world as good and it was something that reflects his glory and his beauty, in Genesis 1, we move into Genesis 3, and it all gets messy. And that mess is there, and it's real, and it's a mess that you and I all, have, all experience. One thing you're going to see within this sermon is a trend, is that you and I are messes at times. If you're honest, you're probably a mess more of a time than you like to acknowledge, even in your own life. But, but how did that happen? Well, humanity turned away from God and his purposes. That God created the world with intentional purpose, intentional plans of making his glory known and walking in relationship with him. But in the garden, that relationship was broken. This is where the mess comes in. That, that was a severed relationship because they, Adam and Eve were tempted by the tempter to follow after that which gives them pleasure. So as you think about Adam and Eve being made to, to know God and to love him and, and walk with him, then you need to then see how rebellion takes place after that. Some would say, well, why do we need to go so far back to even understand our need for forgiveness? 
Well, if you don't understand the type of mess that you create and the type of situations that you get yourself in and its lineage and heritage, it's a struggle to actually apply this idea of forgiveness to your life. It's interesting, when you think about the need of forgiveness, it's hard to think that you chose rebellion. That you willfully went after something that would then need forgiveness to be extended to. It's hard when we think about relationships with other people and the need to be forgiven. Sometimes it's easy for you to come to a person and ask for forgiveness. Other times you're very blind to what's going on. If you think about Genesis chapter 3, I I don't know if they were that blind to their need for restoration. If you think about it in your own life, maybe you've been confronted by something. And you made a mistake. And you need forgiveness. Are you someone who reflects the lifestyle of Adam and Eve in the garden? So they chose the creation over the creator. They chose to eat of the fruit because they told they could experience more in life. And what did they do after that? They, they hid. They hid. The, the, the issue came up, the, the tension in their life, they needed forgiveness, they needed reconciliation, they needed to be restored in relationship, and they hid. It's a mess. They tried to even hide their mess. Is that you? Sometimes I'm like, when life is hard, you've made a mistake, you rebelled against something that is good. You've hurt those whom you love. Do you hide from your mistakes at times? Do you make up different excuses for the reason why you are worthy of being the person that's hiding right now instead of actually dealing with that which is in front of you? Adam and Eve doubled down and hid from their sin and their rebellion. But the beauty in the gospel is this, and is this is beginning to unfold early on in the text, is that God pursues humans in our mess. And he offers us forgiveness. He offers us forgiveness. In the midst of that moment, he extended a hope in the end. This is where the son comes in to be the victor. He will bruise his heel, but he will crush his head. This is a hopefulness for them of forgiveness of their trespasses, of their mistakes, of their shortcomings in their life. This is a sense of hopefulness for them that they can be forgiven for their issues. They can be forgiven for their mess. As we think about this in our own lives and the starting point of the mess, the starting point of feeling like you need to then hide yourself when you become more aware of your mess even. Friends, this is just ample more opportunity for you to see how the gospel of forgiveness actually applies to your life. The beauty of this story is that even when they're trying to hide from God, he still went after them. But in your life, you're going to be tempted time and time again to want to hide. This is why in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 22, it talks about this concept of the old self. This old self that captivates the mind, that that leads you to a former lifestyle. The former manner, manner of living is what the text says, that when you have been changed in Christ, he has redeemed your heart, that the gospel of grace is deeply impacting your life. You had an old way of living, and now you have a new way of living. The old way of living hides. The old way of living doesn't want to seek after God, doesn't want to glorify him with our lives. And so when we think about this concept that the old self seeks self-pleasure and corruption over the glory of God, this is what happened in the garden. That's the same temptation within our own hearts at times, that they chose their own self-pleasure in the garden And they went after that instead of the glory of God. And that's what we see transpiring here in Ephesians chapter 3. That's why it says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. The deceitful desire in the garden 
was that they thought that they could find relationship with God or find relationship with creation in a healthier way outside of God. This is why you need to be renewed in your mind. This is why you need the constant reminder of this gospel and the power that it has to change and transform your life. But without it, you choose the self-pleasure. You choose a former manner of living that is for your own benefit, your own gain, and it will always make a mess where you're in constant need of forgiveness. Or you, you might feel that you're not in constant need of forgiveness for other people in your own head, but at minimum, you're at constant need of forgiveness with God. Why? Because you're choosing yourself over the creator. And the implications of that in your life is that you are saying that, that what is good for you or what you determine as, as best for your life is better than that which God desires for you. And this is where our old self feeds off our old way of life. Friends, there should be a distinct change in your life from when you've come into contact with the good news of the gospel. It's changed your heart from this new life you have in Christ and the old life that you used to live. There should be a difference. It should be a distinct difference where even in the ambitions, even that which you go after should look extremely different. Your priorities of that which brings self pleasure is what leads you down this path of creating messes when relationship with God is not central to even your decisions that you make. You might wonder, well, how do you create the mess? Why do you feel like you're always the person that needs to be forgiven? Well, this is, this is how. You're not, you're not placing God at the center of your life. You're choosing that which gives you gain, which is self-pleasing, which might be your former manner of life, which it truly is. You did whatever was good for yourself, not caring about the collateral damage. Well, it gets me through the day. It gets me through the week. But there's brokenness around you. There's hurt. There's pain. Transgressions. Friends, it's so easy to create a series of mess that feel like they just keep folding into another mess. Sometimes it feels like your mess is so deep that you don't know how to get out of it. This is why it's important to remember this good news that Jesus brings to our lives of forgiveness for messy people, that he came to dwell among us, fully God, fully man, perfect in every way possible, so that he could go to the cross on your behalf that despite your mess, despite your ability to fix yourself, that he would be the one who could extend forgiveness to you in a way that you've never felt before. Christ came to die for the messy people. The people who need deep forgiveness in life. I think that's an anchor for us in our lives for this reason. That if you want to grow in maturity and community and walk alongside of other believers, you need to understand first your own proclivity towards mass or your own issues in your life so that you will be a forgiving person to others. We had a start here because many of us struggle to see ourselves as in need of forgiveness. When's the last time that you had to seek after forgiveness? If it's been a long time, maybe you're not as in tune with your own heart and your own issues that come up and emerge within you. Maybe you, you struggle to see the power of the gospel to transform minds and hearts. Sometimes you don't say it, but you think it. You need to remember the forgiveness that is extended to you in Christ. As we come together as a community and we're seeking to build something that brings glory and honor to God, we need to remember that Christian community is made up of messy people in need of Jesus. Our, 
I'm trying to push us back against the whole veneer that you come to church and you have to have it all together, right? I'm trying to get you all to, to breathe a little bit, to be okay with being messy, to be okay with actually needing redemption to be applied to your life, to be okay to, to talk about the mess at times. Because if this is not a safe enough space for you to talk about your need of redemption, then I don't know what place will be. Christian community calls us to do life with sinful people. Part of my aim of this, this message is to focus it on verse 32. But I need us to think back through verses 25 through 31. Because these are the type of people that you're dealing with. This is the type of people you're dealing with. This is the type of person that you are. Okay? You're supposed to put away the falsehood. You're supposed to speak truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger. How many times have you held anger towards somebody else? You let the sun go down on it. This is a command for you that are in Christ, that you are now living the new life, that you're putting away the old self, but the old self holds grudges. The, the old self has issues for a long time that you allow to sit there to destroy relationships, to leave churches. Be angry, do not send it. That be angry part is not just an unlicensed type of anger in your life that you just get angry about things and justify. That's more a, assuming a justified, righteous anger toward sin in the world. But in that anger in your life, it should not lead you towards sin. Just because somebody does something wrong doesn't mean that you go to work on them verbally or whatever because they're wrong. It's that you understand that which does not honor God and you're broken hearted, you're frustrated about it, but then you, you don't retaliate in response to it. But also you're not supposed to let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because you don't want to give an opportunity to the devil. There's many relationships that have been hurt in community where forgiveness has not been expressed because you allow the sun to go down on your frustration towards somebody. Where you wake up the next day and you don't want to be as connected to them. And the more time that you give is the more numb that your body will become so it's a reality of those frustrations, and you begin to justify your own anger. This is why it says give no opportunity to the devil, because that's, that's easy work at that point. You're already given room, because the temptation is there, for him to make the most of that situation. Are there elements in your life where you're creating opportunity for the devil in this? Are you allowing your anger to grow? that you are sinning actively right now based on your own frustrations here. Doing honest work with his own hands. So he's nothing to share. What, what, what's the next in verse 29 here? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion. Corrupting talk coming out of your mouth is a quick way to ruin relationships. I know how y'all are, and I know how people are, right? The moment that you hear, they say, what about who? About me and mine? I'm done with them. You cut them off quickly. You're, you're severing relationship. You're good until it's me. You can talk about everybody else and all their stuff, but, but, but me, that's wrong too, by the way. Don't. We got to go there. We got to talk about this because... This corrupting talk is not for the building up. It's saying that like, your words, your mouth are supposed to build up other people to encourage them to grow in the gospel and the love of the Lord. But that us putting away the old self in community is us having mouths, speech, that bring glory and honor to God and helps others to understand who he is. These are the people you're called to do life with. And they're wrecks at times. It's frustrating. Well, I didn't expect in the church to ever hear somebody ever say something about somebody else. 
You're in a place with a bunch of messy people. Does not justify it. They need the redemption of the gospel. This is why it says speak the truth to another. Verse 25. Having put away the falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Encourage them to walk in the pathway of righteousness to, to honor the Lord. But there's a weeding out of this process of sanctification happening. That it may give grace to those who hear. That's what our words should do. Maybe you've been someone that your words have not given grace to those who hear. Maybe you need forgiveness for that in your life. Maybe you're known as the person who's always just tearing down others. Who's always focused on the negativity of things that are happening around you. You maybe didn't create a mess with the relationship you're having, but you're perpetuating people's perspectives of others in their messes. Maybe you need forgiveness to be extended to you in that. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Spirit's work in your life because he's trying to call you to better living you're pushing that him away from working in your life because you're choosing that which satisfies the former way of living. Some of us got old bags, not new tricks, old bags with old tricks that you pulled out in the moments when you're feeling tension in life. Can, can we talk about that for a moment? Because at times when we're hitting these hard moments in life and you know you shouldn't do what you're about to do, but but the playbook's there. You, you've memorized the playbook. you worked through it many times. It's gotten you through situations, and you, you felt relatively unscathed. See, friends, the change from the, the new self to the old self is you desperately seeking after the Spirit of God to do a work in you, not just in regeneration, but in spiritual transformation. That starts with the renewing of the mind, as the text says earlier on, and that renewing of the mind shapes the way that you are engaging community. This is all about relationships in community. This is how we all benefit from it. This is why forgiveness is necessary in community because we're the people that keep making a mess of community. Yet Jesus calls us to his people. He calls us to labor well for one another. He calls us to do life with sinful people. This is why we start off Pretty often, even if you've ever been to the weekend, or I encourage you to go to it if you have not been, but we talk about pastorally where it's important that people understand that they are, by birth and nature, a sinner. To understand that that sinful impact is pervasive in their life. Because if your starting point to walking into this community of believers is, you know what, I have it pretty much together and I don't really make that many mistakes, you know, I'm kind of beyond the whole sin thing. It's probably a hard relationship moving forward. Because what happens when someone tries to talk to you about a mistake that you've made or when they feel sinned against? And there's certain times in your life where it happens in ways that you don't even realize. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't even realize I, I, cut, I, I cut you off in a conversation. I didn't intend to, but in my head, I didn't realize it. Brother, sister, please forgive me for that, that I was not understanding and seeking to hear you out in this. It doesn't have to be the massive issues for you to need repentance and, and forgiveness in your life. But we should be people that are seeking after forgiveness in relation with one another often. Why? Because we know we've been forgiven in Lord Jesus Christ and that we can confidently walk in these relationships in this manner. See, Christian community, as it causes us to do life with people, that means you're rubbing shoulders with them. The closer you get to folk in here, the more issues you probably will see with folk in here. It, it's easier to stay in arm length, keep a little space, and keep the image that you want to have. It's harder when you get into the house and you see in other spaces and other opportunities or seasons, you're like, they don't have it all together. That they struggle. And that's actually good for you. Here's why it's good. 
because it helps you to understand how the gospel can apply to your life because you're struggling too. Right? And oftentimes in many Christian spaces, there are churches that, that gather and form um, on Sundays, hear the preaching of the word, they gather in spaces to hear the, the, the teaching of the Bible or to communicate or discuss it, but they miss out on the day in and day out life on life. Some of the closest people to you, you will see their sin even more so. But do you love each other to walk through those seasons? To, to endure with one another in this community? We've been talking about in this series, you're called to it. You need to press into this community. But will you labor with one another? Why? Because Christian community calls us to be kind and tenderhearted to sinners. The people who need this grace. Tenderhearted to the ones whom Christ himself is tenderhearted to. Who walked alongside of, who, who he cared for and loved and, and pointed to the grace that has been dis, dispensed for them. Jesus. See, when we remember Jesus in this way, our relationships will become richer. When you experience forgiveness and transformation in community, it will bind you together closer than before. It gives an opportunity for sanctification to take place even in our own life when you extend forgiveness. I, I get it. Extending forgiveness is hard. I, I get it. The concept of letting go in the same manner that Christ is forgiving you can be hard for us to comprehend at times. For us to move beyond all the issues or the roadblocks that we've built up in our own lives, that it can be hard. But you forgiving somebody else is not an opportunity even for you to grow. It's not about you just wanting them to grow. It's an opportunity for you to grow. Because does your forgiveness look like the forgiveness that Christ gives us? Friends, Verse 32, verse 32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. But look what he says before that. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. We're going to come to that here in a moment. Last, my last point I'm going to make this morning. Christian community reinforces the need for you to get over yourself. The cross reminds us we all need forgiveness. And when you think about the power of the cross in your own life and what Jesus does in saving you and extending Forgiveness to you, even though you keep making mistake after mistake after mistake, knowing that you are forgiven in him at the cross, right? That's so rich for us. But when you think about what happens in community and relationships with other people and what can fizzle there, it's important that the cross is a constant reminder for you in your life. Here are some of the examples of the things that you need to forgive people for. Belief in falsehood, anger, corrupting talk, bitterness, wrath, clamor, and malice. This is just what this text is talking about here. But in short, this text assumes that and give an opportunity to the devil here that people will allow certain things to take root. Some of y'all are bitter right now. Y'all are bitter for the lives that other people have. You're jealous of what people in your community are experiencing. To a point where it's allowed something to emerge within you that you're so self-centered and self-focused that you treat them differently. You are bitter. You struggle to even see 
the grace of Jesus working in others because you're so bitter and frustrated with your own situation. You need forgiveness. You need Jesus. But maybe you even need to ask for forgiveness because you've been treating people differently because of that which they're going through. For some, your bitterness has led to a sense of desire and wrath. Some of you are like, that's not me. That's, that's a little too heavy here. Some of you are okay looking at others and they make mistakes. They go through different seasons in life. And you're like, well, they just got what they deserve. Oh, that's another way, nice way to put the wrath part, right? They got theirs. You'd rather see the, the wrath poured out on them than them experience the grace of God transform them. It's real. The anger there, the clamor. But let me talk about the slander. Some of y'all, it's easier for you to slander others instead of dealing with your own self. So this is why when you're focused on talking about what's going on in everybody else's life, you don't got to worry about your own life. Because it's your own copingism of being able to deal with the situations. And I, I want to encourage somebody this morning. Maybe for you, you need to stop with the slander. You need to put it away. You need to grow and mature in your renewing of the mind. You need to leave these things behind. Because you've hindered relationships. This is why it says, put it away from you. Along with all the malice. You can't keep running your mouth and assume that you don't have bad intentions with it. There's a connection there. You're not wanting their good. Some of us, we just got too much time on our hands to just be talking about everybody else. Some of y'all need jobs and hobbies or other things. Uh, because, nah, for real. For, nah, this, is, this is real. There's a sense of aimless living when you don't have anything to do on, on a Friday night, nothing fun to enjoy, that you got to sit there and just talk about other people. That your life is that boring that you can't, over coffee, talk about what's going on in your life, but it's easier for you to talk about other people. Friends, that's what's going to keep you away from sin when you're focused on the cross and seeing the the glory and the power there, the possibility of transformation for you in your life. But it's going to take you getting over yourself. Here's another way that you have to get over yourself. You need to be able to extend forgiveness for these things that are mentioned here before repentance is acknowledged. Hold on. You're not always going to have a conversation with them, but you need to be able to forgive somebody for that which they've done, for the malice that they've caused, for the anger that they've caused, for running your mouth, running their mouth about you. You need to be able to forgive them before they might even repent. Because they might not repent. But it, within yourself, you're holding it all in until they do. You know the person who's really suffering in that? You. You're suffering because you're struggling and you're going to become bitter. You're going to become malicious. You're not going to know what to do with yourself and it's going to lead to ruin. Friends, don't wait. Some of y'all are waiting right now. If they just realize their ways. Some of y'all are doing this with your spouses in certain ways. If they just understand how they've hurt me and what they've done, then I'll forgive them for this, and then we'll deal with it. No, no. In Christ, you've been forgiven, and he's called you to forgive others as a reflection of that which Christ has done. You need to be able to forgive them before you even walk into the conversation. It's not that, well, if they say the right things, then I'll forgive them. No, you are power hungry. You want the the power in the relationship to be able to say, they've done enough to be worthy enough of your forgiveness. So you're already forgiven in Christ. You're forgiven. He didn't lay out the long list for you to get all these things right and then you're forgiven. No, no. Fully accepted by his grace. So don't do that to other people. 
See, friends, when we can start to do this, you'll be able to embrace forgiving people with tenderness and love. Friends, as you think about the Christian life and the issues and the heartache that comes, if you want to be consistent and faithful to Jesus in this, you're going to have to embrace those who make mistakes. You have to let them know verbally that they are forgiven. You need to show them by your posture and demeanor that they're welcomed. This is something that's beautiful in the story of the prodigal son. The son goes and makes a bunch of mistakes. He has to go and find out the hard way, out in the wild, doing whatever he wants to, partying, doing all these things. But then he comes back and his father throws him one of the greatest feasts, welcomes him in fully because he's been forgiven. When someone's forgiven in Christ, it's not that thou, now they have to earn back the right for you to care for them in the way that Christ calls you to care for them. Again, some of you are not actually forgiving people for their issues and their mistakes in life. You're merely just trying to reconcile, and in your version of reconciliation, you just want your world or your relationship to be feasible, to uh, whether cohabitate in or to, you know, to, to be in the same spaces together. But you're not actually forgiving them. Some of us haven't maybe learned what it means actually to forgive. I love the phrase people will use at times. Well, I mean, you don't forgive and forget. You always keep it locked away. Y'all better hope our Lord don't apply what you want them, what you want to utilize, right? Because, oh... He's forgiving you, but he got that list. We got to put this in perspective, friends, because that's been our vision of forgiveness. You, you haven't forgiven someone if they make a mistake again where you're pulling out the laundry list of all the issues that they have done in the past similar to that. No, you didn't forgive them for those. You're just holding it above their head. And if, if that is your view of the Father, Son, and the Spirit's love for you and the way they... He's forgiving you. I'm so sorry because you're missing out on what it means for you to be finished at the cross, what it means for you to be fully forgiven in that. Now, that is not taken away from saying that you don't need to grow from your mistakes. If you have truly repented, repentance is turning away from your sin. This is the other side of it. You can forgive someone fully, but to know that they repented is for them to turn away from that sin and walk in a different direction. The repentance element is on their side. The forgiveness is on you. When you put that into perspective, it will help you to, to maneuver. Another way for you to help to navigate forgiving people is that forgiving people forgive like Jesus on the cross. Here's what I mean by this. As you're called to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. There's a moment where in life where people don't really realize like the weight of their words or their actions, the rumors that they started, you know, the mouths that they've created. And Jesus gives us an example. He's hanging on the cross and the people have put him up there to die. And his words are this. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, he says, Father, they know not what they do. They don't have to know what they've done for you to forgive them. But for you, if you actually learn from Jesus in this, even when they've done the most egregious thing to him, put them on a cross to die. And he can look past. That's a big deal. So what's holding you back from actually having a biblical vision for forgiveness and community? What's stopping you? Friends, if you're withholding forgiveness, if you're struggling with this concept in your own life, 
I just want to say maybe that's a sign of you living in the old manner of life. Maybe it's a sign of the corrupt mind, the deceitful desires. Maybe Jesus wants to continue to renovate even your own heart and your own mind. I think this will lead to richer communities here. Because when we have groups of people gathering that can extend forgiveness to one another, that can walk through hard times, being tenderhearted when people are restored. See, when we forgive people, we hope and pray that they'll be restored into godliness. They will walk in that way of life. We desire that. We want to celebrate that in their life. And we want to be so caring for them, even as they're going through the process of sanctification. But it takes the commitment. It takes a long-term vision. It takes you getting over yourself. And that's really hard to do at times when we tend to make community about us. Friends, I don't know who you are struggling to forgive right now. I don't know what they've done to you. I don't know if it's just been years of mistreatment. I don't know who you're bitter with right now, whose life that you want, you so are are desperate after getting. I don't know who's been running their mouth about you, whether it's at work or whether it's in another space. But what does it look like for you to apply the gospel to this area of life? I know some might have heard this sermon and think, well, you haven't really dealt with the other side as much of what does the repentance look like? That's coming. But I don't want you to punt downfield right now. Because some of you are waiting on somebody else's action to deal with something within you. And that waiting is hurting you. And that waiting is hurting the community to grow and to flourish the way that Jesus wants it to be. What does it look like for you to leave whatever that is at the foot of the cross today? Knowing that whatever act or mistake someone's done against you or you've done has been pinned to the cross. And that him raising from the grave means that he wants you to walk in newness of life, full from the restraints of the old self, full from the restraints of the old bag and playbook. Pray with me. Father, we thank you today. We thank you that your grace is rich, it's new for us, your mercy is kind for us every day. Lord, I pray as we grow in community that we would be a people that extends forgiveness 70 times 7. Help help us not to keep a tally of wrongs because you've done nothing close to that with us. Lord, I pray that you would build a community of believers here that can work through the hard moments. that can acknowledge when mistakes are made, that can trust each other for forgiveness to prevail, that we will not have to walk with a sense of shame or trying to be worthy of the forgiveness that has been given to us. Help none of us, Lord, to be power hungry here to be the one in authority who's wielding whether or not we'll extend forgiveness or not to another person. Father, for those who are struggling with bitterness, for those who have the residual impact of other people's actions or habits deeply shaping them, I pray that we would be able to, to believe the gospel to be true for us today. That you came, you dwelt among us, you died on the cross for, for messes like us. And the good news is that when you're dying on the cross, that you paid the debt that none of us deserve to be paid this way. 
He rose from the grave three days later. And that means that we too raise and are transformed by the grace of the gospel. Father, we are forgiven people in Christ, and we thank you for that. We ask that your spirit would help us to act on that forgiveness, to consistently and constantly be a forgiving person. In Jesus' name we pray.